All right, we're live. Back again with Rob and Lita. Spidey has performed a magic act and disappeared for the week. And <laughs> to fill things in, though, we bring Gavin Stone from across the pond. So we have two people overseas and Robin Dreek. Howdy, howdy. Now, uh, to introduce everybody really quickly, Gavin, tell us about yourself and your background. Hello there. So, yeah, I'm from England, former uh, civil servant for the British Ministry of Defence. I've spent about 20 years in the security and intelligence industry. I'm a body language statement analysis expert and just become an author of a best-selling book, which is that one, How to Tell If Someone Is Lying. Ooh. Awesome. <laughs> Wait, is it? Is it that one? That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> what is this sorcery? No, <laughs> How did you do no, that? Robin, you're, you can't bring out. That. You bring I'm out. That up, exact no, I was going to grab one of his other ones. <laughs> oh, he's going to be really upset and jealous. Like, oh. <laughs> Rob and I are left out. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, I'm sure that one's on its way. Um, Robin and Gavin actually do a show together. That if everybody stays on here, you'll be literally redirected to it right after this. <laughs> right. Ends. So. Um, and they start at 6.30, so we're going to try to get this in in an hour so we don't make them late for their audience. Multiple Robin, shows. tell us about yourself. You have a work for a three-letter agency, I think. Yeah, so uh, my intro for my podcast, I start with uh, Robin Dreek. I am a former Marine, um, veteran spy recruiter for the FBI, where I ran our behavioral analysis program for counterintelligence. Um, best-selling author as well, three books on trust because that's my big thing i do as i'm a trust expert strategizing good healthy strong dialogues for all aspects of life awesome and very quickly before we get going i need to pay the bills i actually have a sponsor folks so a uh, real short commercial this video is being sponsored by hello fresh you've probably heard of them as they are america's number one meal kit they offer over 50 weekly options, giving an amazing amount of variety of recipes so you'll never get bored. They even have veggie, pescatarian, and fit and wholesome meals to make it easy to stick to your goals. With HelloFresh, step-by-step -step recipes are super easy to follow, and pre-portioned ingredients help cut out the prep time. It's also up to 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant, according to Zagat. To try HelloFresh, just click the link below and you'll get 17 free meals across seven boxes, plus three surprise gifts. Thank you very much. And thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. All right. And we're back. I cut that together. So, you know, <laughs> be or, or you could go to almost any house in my entire neighborhood because I see those boxes every time I go walking. <laughs> they're, they're definitely, definitely popular. An extra plug. There you go. Yeah. Mine, <laughs> mine gets delivered on mine gets delivered on Sundays, so I get to cook for the week. But, See, yeah, actually, there you go, even more. Nice. I gotta order mine. I'm supposed to order one for the group. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the supervisor to say, "Yeah, that's okay," because I, I don't want to just order um, unsupervised, or I'm going to have a problem. So today's theme, okay, is how to recruit a spy. And that was the best way I could put it. I guess it would be mostly. A discussion about elicitation, trust, because that really is your business, Robin, correct, is yep. building trust so you can recruit people to, well, I hate to say be traitors for their own country, but to be traitors for their own country, technically. Or Generally former not country. from their point of view. Well, <laughs> it, it, you know, <laughs> well, I, and, and that's something we can definitely talk about, because I don't think people naturally would say, hey, I'm a traitor and wear it proudly. There's going to be a reason that they're doing it. So that's the second half. What do we look for to see a vulnerability, be it in our organization, amongst our peer group, or anything else, to where this an individual could be recruited for a malicious activity? Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it a question for me? Sure. I'll start with you, Robin. Um, so I don't use the word vulnerability because it can it, it places you in a position of superiority, even in your mind when regarding someone, because if someone is going to literally put their hands and their family's life in your hands, if they think that you're looking down on them in any way, you're not going to have trust and they're not going to do it. And so it's always about and this goes across the board, whether you're trying to recruit a spy 
elicit information, work with coworkers, work with anyone is you're looking to solve pain points of other individuals. So it comes down to identifying the pain points and challenges someone has and offering resources in terms of solving those pain points. When it comes to spies or, you know, people I've worked mostly against Russia throughout most of my career, it was identifying those individuals that had priorities and pain points. One, believe it or not, an overarching one was that they couldn't stand Putin and the oligarchs that were ruining their country because they were proud Russians from old aristocracies. Another one was that they had health care issues of elderly parents that were dying or had problems and they couldn't solve them. Other problems were educations for their children that they wanted them educated in the West. So these are all priorities, challenges and pain points that all of us have at varying degrees. And so they just rose to the level of they're willing to exchange resources that they had in terms of my priorities, which happen to be protecting national security, of the United States and our NATO allies. So it really just comes down to identifying priorities, challenges and pain points. That's the first step. And the second step is, will they trust you with their life? And that comes down to, are you going to be open, transparent? Are you going to solve their problems and transports? Are you going to empower them with the choices they need to feel safe? Because that's at the bedrock of all human interactions that we're having when forging trust is, can you make someone feel safe? Because we're genetically and biologically coded to want to belong to meaningful groups and organizations. Why? Because it means we'll be safe and we'll move on, we'll procreate. And there you go. So it really comes down to safety above all. Okay, I'm going to go to Gavin on that. Um, is this um, making them feel safe or making them actually safe? Both. But before we even get to that, I'm going to just say that, that I, I want to clarify that a spy is not an intelligence officer. And I know most of you probably already know this, but it comes from back from like the Lacar books from where they're called spy books and that kind of thing. A bit like the difference between Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. They get confused all the time. Uh, so, but probably a bad analogy there. Um, but yeah, the, the spy is actually the person that the intelligence officer recruits, not mm -hmm. the actual intelligence officer. So when you watch spy movies and things like James Bond that get called spy movies, it, it, that's where the, the confusion starts. So, so yeah, when you when you're hiring somebody uh, to get back to your question, sorry, I just thought better get that in. Um, when you're hiring somebody, um, you are forming a long-lasting relationship. And I know Robin and I have covered this in the past a couple of times. Due to the likes of Hollywood, you got this kind of Mission Impossible kind of scenario where most people think that saving the world revolves around breaking into a building, dancing through a few lasers, killing a few security guards, grabbing a disc, getting out there, and hey, presto, the world is safe. And it's actually nothing like that at all. You build a long-lasting relationship with a person who has access to secrets. And the hardest part is the fact that you've got to convince them to, to remain somewhere where they're disillusioned where they don't want to be, where they've lost all kind of desire to carry on being, and they come to you as a last resort to say, get me the hell out of here, and you've got to say, sure, but first I want you to go back. I don't want you to stay there for as long as you possibly can. I want you to endure it for as long as is humanly possible. And even though you, know, you, 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 got, you want to get the hell out of there, I want you to be there for, you know, as you know an undefined amount of time and the longer you do it the more i will pay you or whatever the case may be to be able to bring information to me um uh, and that in itself is a really difficult job and that's why so many kind of uh, former intelligence officers usually end up going into sales because if you can do that you can sell anything um so yeah but uh sorry i've, I've digressed a little bit but to go back to your question yes it is about making them feel safe because you are in it with them, and they know when it comes down to it, when uh, when when it's down to the bottom line, it's you and them in a relationship together, and there is nobody else. There's nobody coming to save you if things go wrong, uh, especially if you're working in a foreign country. Ultimately, you could end up being in prison for life, killed, whatever the case may be. And when it comes down to it, they're, they're relying on you to get them out of the mucky stuff. Okay, and before I... I'm definitely going to jump to Rob and Alita, but this is a question I had in my mind, so I'm going to pull it from the chat, too. Um, spy versus snitch or informant, uh, are they similar or how does that work? To a degree. Robin, do you want to go? Sure. So to gain that kind of information you need to solve priorities, challenges, and pain points, you generally need people around them. And in the Bureau, we call them confidential human sources. We used to call them assets. Um some people will use loosely terms like double agents, 
but they're basically people that are, are lower level because they don't have direct access to the information that you're seeking to protect national security. They just have access to the people who have access to that information. So they become your 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 tribe of, of people around them that have close interpersonal relationships that can provide you that information, provide you that access. Because many times, especially when dealing with diplomats that are in cover positions, you can't have direct access to these individuals. You need people that are already surrounding them. And so and then if you're using the word like snitch, now we're going on the criminal side where snitch, mm. they're typically people that are providing information about criminal organizations and enterprises. And, yeah, it can be argued that sometimes spies are doing that as well. But believe it or not, 99 percent of the time, people that are spying are really collecting open source information. They're just they just know how to find the right people to attribute it to. So it actually has value. Um, so, but they, yeah, they, they definitely trick, trickle into the areas of proprietary information, confidential information, secret information, but most of the time it is information gaps that their country or nation state has identified as, as gaps of knowledge. And a lot of them are just open source, but hard to get access to, or hard to verify. Cause you can read something in a newspaper, but who cares? Uh, actually if now, if, if Eric says it, because Eric works for so-and-so, well, now it has value. Rob. Got anything? Mice. That's Money. the only thing I know. Yeah. <laughs> Money ideology, compromise, and ego. Uh, ego. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, go on, Logan. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I, yeah. I'm so under, I am so very, very, very <laughs> under credentialed to be here. I'm looking Same. at like books <laughs> and everything else. Like, I I'm like, it. I'm, I'm in the chat, like the, with the people asking questions, oh, yeah. <laughs> the well, difference I've between done, spy and mole. <laughs> I've, I've, had, I've had to do a divorce case of an alias before. That was oh, wow. the closest interaction I've had to do with the spy. Oh, that was fun. <sighs> See, but everyone, everyone's in this in this world more than they believe they are. I, I've literally had this conversation probably three times in the last day, as Gavin can attest to. Also, these are just really good conversations, and everyone has them. You know, if everyone has a case, like a case you're working, a a subject you need to talk to, a boss that's really been an ass. Uh, a coworker that is challenging to work with or even really good to work with and you want to stay working with them. We always have these conversations that rise above the norm and we think a little bit harder about them. And what are we thinking about when we're thinking about harder about them? It's not about, and Gavin used the word, and I didn't correct him because I don't correct anyone, but he, we, we don't convince people to do things. Convincing is about us. We inspire people to want to take action because when you inspire them, it comes from within them. And that's where that whole mindset is. And so anytime we're working with someone that we're trying to change an action or behavior, we hoping they're going to do something different. The high performing people are not thinking of how I can convince someone of my point of view, convince someone to do what I want them to do. The highest performing people are thinking, how can I inspire them to want to in order to inspire them? They have to think it's in their best interest to do those things because here's an overarching thing with all, every single human being. This is what makes everyone very, very predictable. We are all going to always act in our own best interest in terms of our own safety that we talked about, our security and our prosperity for ourselves and those we care about. All we now have to do is figure out what that other person thinks is in their best interest from their perspective, which is empathy. We now know what they're going to do. Now, if I provide you resources in terms of those things, you're going to want to align with me. If I use transparency, openness, and honesty, and vulnerability, which demonstrates you can trust everything coming out of my mouth, because if I'm sharing the things I suck at, you can trust me that I'm probably going to share everything with you. And so that's what, I mean, think about the greatest interactions and dialogues you've had with people that went really, really well. That's what you were doing. That's what everyone was doing. So these are just those conversations elevated up to do it more. That's it. Well, and I, I, maybe I was being a little bit, I think I was being a little bit coy. Um, the, the idea of persuading, you mean like when I have a witness on the stand and I need that witness to say something with an emotion that I need to get out of that witness to persuade a judge that's sitting there in judgment of somebody else. And I try to manipulate the witness by speaking to either their ideology, their desires, their desire for money or compensation, and trying to get Rob, them to you give me manipulate people. I do. Just he inspires them to share what he hopes they'll share. Exactly. <laughs> well, it depends yeah. also whether they're on your side or the other side too, right? Yeah, Rob, that's where it gets, that's, 
that's where it gets even more fun because you can get a witness that's on the other side of you and you have to figure out how to navigate around their brain and you have to be able to convince them that what they want to say is in their best interest or convince them that they want to say something that is actually against their own interests because the judge needs to hear it from a perspective of earnestness. By the way, Rob, you can always, uh, Robin, you can always correct me. I'll, I'll probably still get, carry on getting it wrong, but you, you know, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, right, uh, Alita, you brought up a question in the chat. Um, the spy versus mole. So that would be probably a good one. Yeah. So uh, spy basically is like we, we said, it's somebody who's already in a position and has access to secrets. Um, and you've got like a mole is somebody generally who's sent in, burrows in and pops up and kind of makes their way, infiltrates, if you want to call it that. So at least that, that's uh, that's what, how we look at it. Is that the same for you over in the US for the FBI? Yeah. So moles are, are people like Robert Hansen's that are betraying from within. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why the movie's called The Mole. And then spies are, again, I we don't use that word spy. It's just mm -hmm. kind of a generic term that, you know, Hollywood and the rest of the world uses. We use intelligence officers. We use co-optees of intelligence officers, recruitments of intelligence officers. So there's the vernacular is a little more academic than the common vernacular of a spy. So I, I, yeah, you're right. What would you, okay, on the mole thing, you, I, you surprised me on that because I was thinking of our mutual friend. So how would you describe Jack Barsky versus Robert Hansen? Robert yeah, Hansen so, is against us. Barsky infiltrated. Right. So Jack Barsky was called a deep cover officer. So he was actually okay. consciously working on behalf of a foreign state as a as a what's called a knock a non-official cover officer so most intelligence officers around the world are working on an official cover so they're serving as diplomats because if they're caught doing something illegal they won't be thrown in jail and executed guys like jack barsky he is a what's called a non-official cover officer a knock and so he is acting as a regular person in a fictitious alias which again that's that's a break in the law right there if you're in a foreign country and then if you're conducting a legal activity like gaining proprietary information gaining classified information gaining access to institutions organizations all these things which are legal to do he can actually be prosecuted for it. an intelligence officer that's actually under acting under official cover as a diplomat cannot they'll just be expelled there'll be a diplomatic protest there'll be a tit for tat between the two countries and it all goes away bless you eric <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the mute button worked. It did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Managed okay. to get it just in time. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was close. It was close. Um, oh, and so and then so that's that Jack Barsky. Yeah. Then you asked the comparison to um, Robert Hansen. Sure. Robert Hansen is the you know we it's a term that's been out a lot in the recent years. He, Hansen was an insider threat. And so insider threats come in many forms and, and sizes. Hansen happened to be one that was voluntarily working on behalf of a foreign government that he volunteered to. Some are recruited, but most, I mean, the ones that betrayed us the deepest were the ones that said, Hey, you people have really torqued me off. I don't like you. I have all this, all this, this, these triggers, this trauma, whatever, from their perspective, and I'm going to get back at you. Most of them were based on betrayals that they felt, and they're going to get back at it. They had all these kinds of fictitious, pain points in their minds that they're going to you they need money and all these things and so they're going to then volunteer to work for the hostile service to undermine their own okay fair enough uh, aldrich ames i guess would be the other Same. big yep. big name earl pitts was one um and then you have the military side you have uh down by you in norfolk um the uh, uh the family spy ring it's slipping my mind the navy guy we just talked about it on the show the other day. Anyway, but yes, they happen all over. Now, did your term overlap with Hanson, Robin? Yes. So that was interesting. So Robert Hanson initially volunteered to the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence, which I worked in New York. So Robert Hanson was on my squad in New York before I got to it. He had just left when I got to New York. And so he had actually volunteered to the GRU in New York prior to me getting there. So everyone on my squad knew him. So he got promoted to headquarters because that's generally what organizations do. If someone is really horrible, they just promote him up. Uh, so he got promoted to headquarters uh, where he just maneuvered around there. 
uh, for a while, went over to the State Department. Well, he's the State Department liaison. That's a position down there because we do all these different liaisons. And what had happened was we knew there was a leak both between it was either us and the CIA or us. We had a leak and they had been looked at for a very long time trying to find out who it was because we kept having operations that were being compromised that should have not been compromised. And so uh, it came down to we were able to identify him through a recruitment Interesting. Gavin, you're silent. <laughs> Let me see. I, 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 I was trying to think about what Rob said about mice. I know that, so there's two different versions of mice. And so you, uh, two or three, you got like money, ideology, compromise, and ego, which was then changed to motivation, ideology, coercion, and ego. Um, then you got rice, which was reward, ideology, compromise. And ego. So the, it, it got messed about with and played about with and whatever else. Um, you might be f familiar with the other ones, which are rascals and sad rats, which are uh, you guys use over there. I haven't got a clue. Wow. Sad, rats, sad rats is something like uh, spot, assess, decide, assassinate, terminate, stick the body somewhere. <laughs> and I'll be up on I can't remember. Um, I, 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 I can't remember rascals at all. But over here, I mean, generally, we, we, we don't bother with an acronym. Um, we just go off three things, which is motivation, access, and security. So you're looking for somebody who's got, you know, you're looking for the motivation, like what Robin said, you know, th th this is where we go with it. What's going to motivate them, uh, which could be any number of things. Do they have access to secrets? Uh, and then the most important thing is security, um, uh, which, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is it's not just security for the intelligence officer, but it's uh, security for the asset as well. You don't want to get them into a position where they could get killed. So it generally means you have to go and get everything signed off by somebody who says, no, it's too risky. And you go, oh, I'm going to go and do it anyway. <laughs> this is one for both of you um you would focus on different areas too like uh, hansen for example you would focus him and i think alder james focus on their ego and probably get more support because of their ego whatever they're aggrieved they feel like they're underappreciated or what have you mm -hmm. versus uh somebody else who might have ham uh, family health issues as you mentioned earlier robin is that a fair statement yeah. Uh, yes, it is. And what's a fair statement is every single individual is totally different. I, I like in every operation you're doing when it comes to recruitment. And, it's, and again, I, I like I like to give a paintbrush for everything else in the world is it's like it's like a new business. Because every time you're going to try a recruitment operation, you're literally starting an entire business of selling a product and service to a brand new client. And that client has different needs, wants, dreams, and aspirations. And so it's really understanding that brand new client and how you're going to sell the same service, but frame it in a way that this client's going to want it. And everyone has different pain points. Some are overlapping and universal, but a lot of times it's going to be very individualistic. So it's, I mean, every time I, I did a recruitment operation, which is every time you're assigned an intelligence officer that's yours, you know, generally when I was in New York, we you had about three to five that you're responsible for out of the myriad of them that are assigned to New York. And he, every single one of them is a different operation. It's it, Every single one of them is like, all right, how, how am I going to get a, a group of people around them and gain information about this individual's pain points? And how am I going to present my goods and wares of this individual in a way that at least let them know that, hey, there's someone that might, might have some solutions for you in your life specifically for you. Now, over here, we have another client that is looking for something might be a little bit different. How do I actually frame all my content just for this person? And then Hanson is a whole different one as well. So, yeah, everyone is a little bit different. But what was different with Hanson was Hanson initiated the contact to be a bad guy because he was being a he was a, a betrayer. He was just hands down a betrayer. He was very conscious that he was going to betray the United States of America for his own personal gain because he felt wronged. And I don't I got to caveat this. I was not the case agent on that case. I was uh, affiliated with it in, in different ways. I know the case agents on that case, and they're very, very good, but they're also, they knew him inside and out better than anyone else. And I always want to caveat, I was not the case agent, so I don't want to speak out of turn uh, for, I've been corrected by my friends before on that one, so I want to make sure I'm not. Um, but in general, yes, um, he was a different animal. But his motivations, again, from the overview and the courses I've taught, were very, very similar from feeling disenfranchised mm -hmm. in some way, like Anna Montez was, 
her hers were political ideals and she's the one who volunteered to the cubans uh out of um she had the radio inside of her house yeah right? they generally they all have different trade craft according to what they were comfortable with and what the russians would try to or the cubans in her case were trying to get them to do for comms um and pitts was a completely different one as well because pitts mentality wise psychologically was probably kind of close to hansen but we did what's called a false flag on him to really entrap him, not entrap him, to get him to reinitiate, thinking it was the Russians again on that case because he had volunteered and we found out him years before. So, see, every one of them is just a little bit different because every Hold up, folks. You just it. heard a, a former government agent admit to false flagging. Oh, yeah. False flag <laughs> after the time. <laughs> no, but uh, admitted that we ducked that term. It's like, no. Well, what are you talking about? There's no false flags. Who says there's no false flags? <laughs> yeah. Robin, you you and I have to talk off stream because I <laughs> the, the Hanson, the Hanson, I I had contacts with the family. Like oh, do you grew really? up in the area and the kids yeah, yeah. and we knew the dynamic for how those kids were treated in the household and yeah. very interesting family dynamic that was set and, up. And, and again, I heard third hand exactly similar stuff. And I, I that's why I'm always very careful of not speaking out of turn on it because there's a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of people involved and, and a lot of pain involved. And so I, I never want to diminish any of that or, or really speak that, Hey, I was the gun doing it. Nope. Um, I was very close to the people that were doing it. And I've heard a lot about them. I was involved again in some assessments, but um, yeah, amazing tragic stories. in each of them is a good way to put it. I just told this to uh, Rob earlier. Did you know that there are two Robert Hansons? Yep. That are both notorious. And the other Robert Hanson is the one who emulated the most dangerous game and hunted people down with a rifle, I believe in Alaska. Oh, He's a serial killer. So if your name is Robert Hansen, I probably don't want to come for coffee. <laughs> not 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 other Robs. All Robs are not bad Robs. Just yeah, that's why I go by Rob in. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm I'm over here and I hear the word Hansen, and this puts me in a particular demographic. But I think of I think of, oh, God. I think of the boy band. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> Oh, I am so sorry. I am I am probably not the person to have on this stream. This no, or you could be like I'm, me. I'm, I'm a I'm reality show junkie and Sig Hansen, who you know runs the ship um out of Deadliest Catch. I'm I'm all about the Hansons up there too. Different spelling though. <laughs> all right. I, I, on that note, a few people have asked in the chat. I saw it at least twice. Um, can we talk about um well she's mocked called Fang Fang, but uh Christine Fang and Eric Swalwell? And do you know anything about what happened there, either of you? Because I know you talk around Gavin, you know, a lot of people <laughs> or what could have happened. We, we can speculate. OK, well, well, I'll put an underlying thing that this is all speculation. So you're covered. So go to town. Yeah, that's that's coverage. Yes, that's coverage. <laughs> the attorney is not giving legal advice at all. <laughs> well, I'm you the one giving to, the advice. <laughs> you have to bring me up to speak because I've never even heard the names. I apologize. Eric Swalwell is a representative out of California. Uh, Christine Feng is a Chinese spy. Oh, he was sleeping with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember the case. We, we, yeah, I know the case. Yeah, oh, talking about, um, didn't Diane Feinstein have someone else too? I'm That's not more sure. recent. Yep. So the the, the Diane Fe again, boy, I'm it's racking my memory. So Diane Feinstein, from what I understand, is more um, political connections legit wise with Chinese government, I believe stuff like that, because what happens on the diplomatic side, it gets really, really rough sometimes. And I can, I could be way off on the Feinstein thing that you're referencing, but in general, we have challenges sometimes because we have our, our, our political appointees, our political elected officials that will have contact with some really, really hardcore intelligence officers. And so those are, those become challenging because they have to do the political thing. Meanwhile, if you're from Russia and China and you're a diplomat, the likelihood of you being either an intelligence officer yourself or a co-optee of an intelligence officer is 99.99%. So anytime one of them's talking to one of our diplomats or one of our elected officials, it, it's, gonna, it's going right back to the government to be used against us. And so that becomes a really huge challenge for us on the intel and counterintel side. But when it comes to um, who Eric brought up earlier, uh, and what was the the Chinese uh, female uh, Christine Feng? Yeah, so that case was, it was, it's kind of you know, we've all heard of the the term the honey trap, is very honey trap like where she was a co optee of the Chinese government, and she inserted herself into uh, he was FBI I think right. 
Uh, no, um, uh, Congress. Okay, Congress. All right. So it's 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 happened in a few times in a few venues, but that's Chinese. Chinese will use it. So, yeah, that's the kind of case it was. OK, and, uh, the chat chat knows everything. That's one thing I love about doing this. Is all I can do is just wait and the chat's going to come to the shows up. Right. So uh, her chauffeur, um, Feinstein's chauffeur is who. Ah, uh, there you go. Right, right, right. I guess for now 20 years or something. Yep. Now I remember. Yeah, they've come on a long way. I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm not. I can't mention his name, but he went over to China. Uh, basically, he was approached. They knew who he was straight away, and he said it was so crude um, in front of his wife from the moment he landed. Uh, he was approached by a Chinese individual who was literally talking out the side of his mouth and saying things like, we've got unlimited resources, we can help you out. And he said it was dreadful, it was embarrassing. So obviously they've they've upped their game a little bit since then by that, by that looks of it. <laughs> Sometimes, um, Gavin, you hit a, a huge point, and that is the the crassness of some services around the world are really, mm -hmm. is really bad. It's really in your face. Sometimes... Um, if you have a lot greater resources, you get really lazy. So that's like buying It's like if you had a million dollars and you want to hit lotto, you're just going to buy a million tickets, not even think about the numbers you do. Yeah. Shotgun right? approach. Right. And so that's a lot of times if you have a service that's really huge, like the Chinese and the Russians, mm -hmm. um, you have officers that are fantastic, but also you have ones that are just crass and they're just going to be right in your face. All right. Not you. Next, 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 yeah, next. The numbers next gonna hit. Right. Yeah. I've heard that the best in the world were the Cubans. And they busted us every freaking time. Well, we never got any traction there, and they did some real damage. I mean, can you confirm her? Yeah, they had some really fantastic ops against us. Fantastic ops. A lot of theories on that. Again, very my my stovepipe optic I had because I I I saw a lot, but I didn't see everything. So the Cubans were very good. Because if, think about all our senses that we have. If we lost our sense of sight, we get really good with smell and touch and hearing. And, and so when we lose a sense, the others get really enhanced. Cubans, not a lot of money. And so they're really able to apply the number one thing they have is ideology. And so they would really recruit based on relationship building and ideology. And so if you find someone that is looking for needs a, a strong relationship and they're about a cause and ideology, they're going to really do a great job on that. So I think that's a lot of their stuff. And they also their their networks were very good They're They were trained by the Russians and they have their own um, their own methods and techniques. But, yeah, they had some devastating ops against us, hands down, no doubt. Probably from my knowledge, probably some of the most damaging that's ever been done. Actually, you, you know, you brought that up. Um, Gavin, I think we've actually talked about that offline, that in rice, mice, twice, whatever, <laughs> um, that some of them are more effective than others. Like mm -hmm. you just mentioned ideology, Robin, and, and you know, this is to both of you. Uh, could it be argued that ideology is one of the strongest motivators in terms of of getting consistent service versus money, where you have to keep putting money out and keep, you know, feeding them all the time. So I use the term, and I've said it so many times, I use the term dynamic assessment with absolutely everything you do and with every single case, you have to treat all of them individually. And okay. so to, to, to put what an intelligence officer does in, in a nutshell, you get paid to go over to foreign countries in, in you know, in, in the instance of like uh, when you're working abroad and basically make friends. Um, and when you are making friends with these people, these are lifelong friends and, uh, you, you have to, if you want to call it this, win them over. Now, if you think about, um, all the friends that you've got, you couldn't turn around and say, well, the best pr Christmas present to get all of my friends would be, you know, a, a candle. You, you can't, you can't use a generic one size fits all with this kind of thing. And it's exactly the same with, with when you're recruiting assets. Um, so what, what is effective for um, one person is, is going to be a complete waste of time with another. That being said, we have explored in the past that there are things like ego, for example, uh, which can be an absolute nightmare. Um, and a lot of the information brought back using that method can be questionable. Um, to give you an example, if you've got a guy who's mm -hmm. high up in the bar having a few drinks and a pretty lady comes over and starts chatting to him and rubbing his arm and drinking with him and making him feel good and, you know, really kind of... Uh, and this this is just a 
put a, a theory out there. This isn't necessarily how it works. Um, and yeah, say the right a thing. Theory, Gavin. Just a theory <laughs> about the guy who um, likes a pretty girl at a bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is sure. not saying to him, you know, oh, but you've Never got happens. loads of secrets and blah, blah, blah. He might say, yeah, did you know this and did you know that? She goes back, tells her a superior, and uh, and it, it all turns out to be BS because he's just had a few too many drinks and he's showing off. So it, it's not necessarily credible uh, all the time. It depends on how it's obtained. So ego is great for building the relationship, but not necessarily great for obtaining intelligence. Does that yeah, make generally sense? speaking, in DC, in the bars, um, if the person is talking about what they do or who they are or who they have access to, they're lying. Mm. That's, that, it, that is that is that is DC to a T. You, you can always it? you can always spot the young ones, and you can always spot the newbies and the staffers based on how much they're talking. <laughs> yep. <laughs> have you ever heard of a dangle? Oh yeah, yeah. Lots of no. Oh, no, no. no <laughs> what is that? You, you can't throw things out like that. I mean, uh, basically, <laughs> basically, a, a dangle is, is a, a similar kind of thing, but we, we, we kind of went into it a little bit earlier. Somebody was using honey traps. It doesn't necessarily always have to be uh, an opposite sex uh, kind of thing, but it's usually somebody who appears to have access to secrets, and basically they're they're trying to catch somebody in the act of espionage in their country. So it, it's it, it's somebody who you know that you look at, you think, all oh, right, they've got. Uh, access to secrets you go you try to recruit them and then the next thing you know if you're under diplomatic cover you're being deported with uh, persona non grata stamped on your passport or if you've got uh, if you're uh, noc or knockers uh, which is non-official cover uh, then yeah the consequences are a little bit worse so just a tad <laughs> i guess you I, I um i've got two lawyers here um we don't believe in entrapment so that that is entrapment but in the intelligence world i would say <clears throat> Probably, I think there's different laws. Uh, give us, give us a gotta, clue. You, this is your you expertise. You gotta, you, you gotta catch him. You gotta charge him. You have to have an identity to charge. I mean, no, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm asking. Alita, Alita, do you want to field this one? It depends on what okay. you're going for, because very rarely. So, in my world, the last thing we want to do is prosecute someone, because that means you failed to recruit them, and so mm. using using. A, a dangle for us on the counterintelligence side is we're, we're putting someone in front of them that might be a resource for them. And then we're kind of saying it's not quite that it's this, um, but we're not trying to jam them up and put them in jail. Cause that would be entrapment and you can't do that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create access to, to be a service to them mm -hmm. where now on the legal side, when it comes to, if we're going to go for the marsh, we're going to try to jam them up legally the State Department is, is so over the top of what we have to do. So that's why we, we use video. we got to get them in the act. We have to do all these things because if we're going to jam them up, especially if we're going to try to jam them up legally, um, you need a lot of non-entrapment, especially if you're going to start using the espionage statutes, which you have to show intent. You have to show uh, knowingly um, going to a, a foreign country, you know, a state don't, you know, all these statutes come to come into play and you actually have to show that this person is willingly, wittingly doing things on behalf of a foreign government and they know it's classified and bad. Mm -hmm. and that's a huge bar to reach if you're going to go legal wise. It's a different. And so that's a completely different thing when we're talking about recruitment. And I just remembered. Sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting there. But uh, U.S. No, I was I trying ahead. to remember U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, this doesn't. It, this becomes an issue when you try to prosecute or try them, period, end of story. And it becomes important in civil contexts where they're trying to file a lawsuit to recover anything. Uh, the Zabeda. Uh, Zabeda. Uh, Zabeda. Hmm. Um, hmm. That was a case in Supreme Court. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court case last year was decided in term. Um, Zabeda was trying to essentially get information on how he was treated. He was alleging that he was tortured. And you had different governments throwing treaties in the way and refusals to disclose. And the case went all the way up to Supreme court. So you have valid subpoenas being issued for the disclosure of documents. And the U S Supreme court decided seven to two, that they weren't going to allow information released from uh, CIA black sites during this period based on state secrets privilege. So the legal hurdles and what looks like black letter law and should be done oftentimes doesn't play out that way. Once you throw intelligence mm -hmm. in the mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me field from the chat here. I got a super chat. So, hey, cash, folks. <laughs> okay. um, Sean is asking kind of a question statement. Um, 
about Jack Barsky's story and comparing to Yuri um, Bezmanov, and I'm guessing Yuri is uh, someone who, oh, I forgot, escaped, uh, left the Soviet Union. What, what do they call that again? Defected. 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 Thank you. Um, he believes Yuri over Barsky. How would you characterize Yuri Bezmanov? I don't know Yuri's um, story, but I know Jack's really, really well. I know Jack really well now, and all because of Eric, and I've done a lot of work with Jack. The only thing I'll, I'll say is, since I don't know Yuri's and I know Jack's, they're probably not incongruent, and if they are, Jack's is because, and he's the first to admit it, Jack was stovepipe like this. Jack knew Jack's training and Jack's training alone. He wasn't at part of a diplomatic establishment. He was a solo the entire time. He was trained solo. So his inside knowledge on operations with as a paintbrush of how the all Russians operated, how diplomatic establishments operated, he gained most of that knowledge from people like us. So his his knowledge was stovepipe because he was a deep cover and for his own protection and the protection of everyone else they they are com heavily compartmentalized and so if he if his story is incongruent with someone else's it's not from intent it's just from he just doesn't know it is is again i'm just guessing because i don't know your story that he's talking about i hope that answers the question right and by the way um one note about jack i, I love talking about jack marski he's been great to have on <clears throat> those who think that his life was glamorous as a deep <laughs> undercover <laughs> It is like, take your yeah. life and then add a second job that is hanging over your head in order for him to communicate. I forgot. It would literally take him hours to have to figure out his path and then take pictures to the film with another picture to get it down to a micro dot. And it was like every week he had to spend like six to eight hours, always on the weekend or Saturday, which screwed up his weekends. And this is what helped get him to flip. And help get him to um, say I quit was it was just complete aggravation because he had to live a complete normal life too with a full time job everything else, but then he had to go be a spy or um, an officer or whatever else and report back. Um, am I exaggerating, Robin? It's exactly right. It became exasperating, and the big thing that he'll tell you because I've heard him say it numerous times it was really the birth of his uh, daughter Chelsea. That was really his final reason that he wasn't going to leave the family here. He, he had had multiple families because he's yeah. living multiple lives. That's a good question. On that. And yes, uh, yeah. I, um, it is funny because Sean asked this and I was laughing and thinking about Barsky. Barsky had, <laughs> had a good wife question. and child in Germany while he was here and had a wife and children. And I think by all laws, yeah, he's a bigamist. Um, don't know hmm. who. How else uh, to say can, it? Uh, let me pull another one up too. Um, when did your cover story become your story? I, I made a comment earlier that I've done alias divorces. Mm. That's when your cover story becomes a story right. and you have something on paper that needs to no longer be on paper and you need to go through a legal process to make it legal. Hmm. But everything is documented. Everything is there. Uh, it's just everything is a fiction. So I'm, like I'm getting law? I'm getting Mr. and Mrs. Smith vibes. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's my yeah. that's yeah. my that that's it's, my frame of reference here. It's a good one. Yeah. Well, a very good one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it that's not too bad. They basically you have two people that are living, or at least one of the people in the relationship is living um, as an alias, and you can't ever disclose details of uh, as an attorney of what you've seen or or who these people are. But there are attorneys and there's a process that has to be done to make sure that documents are not disclosed or that when documents are disclosed during the divorce process, let's say you have opposing counsel on the other side who's becoming really aggressive with documents, the attorney has to be there to vet everything and make sure it doesn't get disclosed. And you've got to make sure that you're not allowing information um, to get out there that would otherwise be completely discoverable in a divorce case. And the person that you're divorcing, they are married on paper but that's not the real person that's married. That's so fascinating. That's All right, well, they're, they're weird cases. And, well, and well, that, it's actually, and, here's that, the, and here's a similarity. When we do resettlement cases, they're called PL 110s, public law 110. When we resettle, someone is actually defected and they've, we've, we've squeezed them for everything they could possibly do while working for us in place. And we resettle them in, in 
fake names and and everything like that it's very similar to that yeah so all new documentation and it's funny what how you have to because of our legal system you actually have to walk them across the border in a fake name so you can parole them back in <laughs> with ice even though you just can't make wave a magic wand and so literally <laughs> i've walked people across bridges in canada and back just so we could get a stamp and make it legal <laughs> um because our agencies don't talk well together <laughs> Well, I hope you had a real sense of irony while you did that. That's all I can say. It's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, super chat from Andy, the game maker. This is uh, for you. Law and lumber would be the worst spy. He gives his Snickers like a kid in elementary school whenever he's about to pull a prank. <laughs> Andy, you'd be very, you'd be very, very surprised, Andy. Andy and uh, that also is, from that's... Andy, beat Navy, sucker. Andy, be nice. This my is my brother, by the way. For money, I understand Army is like the worst, aren't they? No, this uh, year, last couple of years, Army has been very rocking it, although we finally won a game this past weekend. But I went Marine Corps, so I got my Marine Corps emblem. I honor both. My son's a Naval Academy grad, and he's at, but he's also a Marine right now, too, at Quantico. Navy uh, go about to be a Marine Corps pilot. So we have to honor both in my house since we're both grads, but we're both Marines. So you you cherry pick according to whoever's winning. I and, and it's because we're going to be on with <laughs> Lena next, and Lena um, Cisco, she was Navy, so I always I always try to wear a Navy shirt sometimes too. So and literally uh, it was hanging on my chair right here. That's what that's the real reason. Well, you were used to it, right? I mean, Lena's the boss, and you know you were Marines. You worked for the Navy. Always the, the men's department. <laughs> of the Navy. All right, I get a super sticker from JoJo. Thank you, and a new member, Laura. Thank oh, you yeah. very much. Welcome, Laura. And um, this is a good general one from um, Brian Jaffe, who I know Gavin knows. <laughs> Everyone knows Brian, yeah. <laughs> what intelligence agency impressed you or impressed you the most? And this goes to both of you. Do you want to go first, Robin? You go, Gav. I'll go then after you. Okay. I'm going to be biased, obviously, because, obviously, you know, being British, MI6 are always going to be favored by me. However, when it comes to operations and that kind of thing, Mossad are phenomenally compartmentalized. I mean, like, so compartmentalized it's untrue. One part won't know what the other's doing, and, and one operation might have several people on it, and they don't even know each other that they're working on the same uh, operation. Unless they, unless they get caught trying to pull off a hit in Canada? Yeah, that kind of does backfire on them sometimes, you know. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 what what they do and how they work is, is really really great. And and if the, you know, so some agencies I'm not going to mention any by name, but they are really really open, and they will all know what's going on and who's working in what department. There's lots of what's known as rumming, uh, rumor intelligence or water cooler talk. Um, other agencies are, are very very secretive, um, and you know. But yeah, Mossad. Uh, they impressed me on how they operate. So. Yeah, for me, operationally, when it came to doing things, absolutely, Israelis are really good at doing things. When it came to recruitment operations, I worked with the, what's called the Five Eyes, uh, Brits, Canadians, Australia, New Zealand, and us. And I've worked with them all. And I'm, I'm a lover of the Queen, as I say, because <laughs> my five and six are phenomenal. And the Aussies were also phenomenal. Every time I did an op, with a partner service it was always phenomenal i i i didn't have a bad experience with it including our own the agency for us and the dia also phenomenal it comes down to individuals in each of those organizations if they are about their business they're about forging great relationships um it's amazing i i haven't had a favorite although i i am partial to the queen as i used to say <laughs> now as i guess it's the king um oh, but, yeah <laughs> But um, I, I love the Brits because they always had a lot of money to spend. And their methodologies were very, very similar to ours uh, on the recruitment side in the FBI. Mm -hmm. So it was always they had patience. They had technique. Um, they were aggressive. And they were just a, a joy to work with. And so were the Australians. It just came down to targets of opportunity that overlapped. Well, didn't the Brits create ours? I mean, CIA was essentially built by um, Wild Bill Donovan and the Brits, right? Yeah. Originally in Canada. <laughs> and then eventually migrated it was true the training was done in canada uh and then it moved south and uh, be eventually became the cia well give homage to good old george don't forget him he had spies up and down <laughs> oh, yeah. as well 
Yeah, it's the oldest trade in the world, really. It is. Isn't it? You know, back to the the you know the, the Romans times of Jesus and and beyond. And, uh, I don't know if it's the oldest. Maybe second oldest. Oh there's yeah, another, there's yeah, another old one. Oldest, yeah, there, there is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not about that one. <laughs> don't use those anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. allegedly. Sometimes <laughs> they intermix, right? Oh well, yeah. first became the tool, the second. Yeah, we're back to honey. Oh, ball. never heard that one. I'm. A, that's an interesting line. Just came up with it. I like that. I like that. <laughs> one. We're talking about honey traps. <laughs> well, and okay. Uh, on that, now we're going to jump into some speculation and have some fun because on right. another show I do, America's Untold Stories, we're going to be doing a series called Honey Traps. Ah. And yeah. we have some real speculation. So we won't name any names, but Robin, you've been around for a minute. Do you see that there are some odd relationships? between senior politicians maybe network owners etc and young wives who seem to come out of nowhere or very exotic that could possibly be a honey trap type situation current ones i have no idea i don't i don't follow the social media like that but has that happened absolutely 100 percent. have you been exposed to any um in, in your career that you've had to break apart or discover or whatever. I'm, I'm racking my brain. So the cases I can, there's a few cases I consulted on, um, especially, you know, we're talking about the Chinese ones out on the West coast. There's a few out there that were, that were honey trap. It's, it's a broad term because there was, there was one that we worked where it was a, a Chinese female and it was much greater than just a, 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 a sexual romp for a honey trap. It, this was like long-term get married or talk about getting married relationships, but it was still being controlled by the Chinese government. Um, and yes, when you, when you take that optic back and you're looking at the two individuals, you're like, there's no way that this person would be interacting with this person. But then again, I do know of cases where, they would take an age appropriate opposite sex individual and put them in front of someone and it was used very effectively. Um, so yeah, they still use them that it's, it's not probably as common, but yeah, they're still being employed. No doubt. Okay. So I'm going to go to the headlines now and I figure it's safe. I keep reading about infiltration in universities by the Chinese. Oh, yeah. Like, like an entire that. university being tossed or things that went on. Do we have a giant problem here? Oh, yeah. Have been. Uh, it's, I, I've been, so I've been, I was in the bureau for like 21, 22 years. And from the day I got in, that was a problem. And it's never been gone away. So our, our universities are hugely penetrated. Because you get what's called a uh, an F1 visa. I believe it's F1 because we track mm -hmm. visas in the bureau. And so it's if people it's because there's a no, it's H1. Oh, God, it's been so while. I apologize. H, it's the H1, the spouses and uh, dependent visa. Yeah. And what happens is, is that especially with the Chinese, it, it used to be it was easy to identify the ones that were being state sponsored because there was the Chinese government that was sponsoring their visa to come here to study. And they would come to study and they get placed in universities for plasma physics or for plasma physics and, and all the high tech stuff that was unclassified programs at, at the lower level. But once they finished the unclassified work, it would then get promoted into the classified work. But all the Chinese, Russians, Iranians, I don't care where it's from. Everyone's at this lower level doing all the research at our universities under grants from the U.S. government. But they are actually state sponsored from foreign actors and yeah that was that's a huge problem that's that's how they're getting most of our technologies because you know the 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 world is one big happy exchange of information at that lower level well that's where they're getting it all from and they just take the next step so what they'll do is they'll take that information at the lower level they'll go back to their countries their own universities and then they will cherry pick using linkedin and things like that individuals that can finish the project off at that higher level um, on top of yeah. that, there are actually more Russian spies, if you want to use the word spies, uh, right now in London and America than there ever was in the height of the Cold War. Oh, yeah. Why so, is that? Just, Easier. Mean, yeah. Well, oh, okay. Isn't it just a matter of just identifying them and tracking them because you then use them as an asset, like in reverse? 
uh, it's been efficient. <laughs> Basically, that. as long as you know where they are, what they're doing, and who they have contact with, the only thing that they can do is hurt. How do you track it? How do you track it though? It's, it's encrypted. Uh, yeah, as, as parents of say three teenage kids to track their three teenage kids and see how well that works. Good point. Um, <laughs> and, and then look at the fact that, you know, if, you, if you're a government of a country with over 350 million people in it and it's sort of tracking kind of a, a group of Chinese in, a, in a, a country as huge as America, it's, yeah, it's, it's one hell of a Here's thousand. a great example to talk about the challenge of it. When I was in um, one, the Norfolk division of the FBI, one of the smallest FBI field offices, you have one counterintelligence squad and you have about, Eight, eight agents on that squad and you're covering every single university this is down by you eric one you know you have one squad covering every single university in that one small division's area of operation that's a small section of virginia very very small section of virginia not even the whole state there's other two divisions over the rest of the state we literally had hundreds upon hundreds of na of foreign national students that were state sponsored by china and russia across our a AOR and you had a couple of agents working that problem. Figure well, out. Okay, it's okay. And uh, because I'm concerned it is here. And last time I checked the heaviest concentration of nuclear power and energy in the entire world is here where I sit because of all the at your nuclear house? I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> without, uh, exactly. I'm glowing. <laughs> People say that I'm blowing. <laughs> now you know why, right? Able base. You say, hey, we hear helicopters in the background. All of a sudden, <laughs> people are breaking. <laughs> Countdown: five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> exactly. No. Um, having all of that concentrated here, and we have seals here. Yep. We have uh, a lot of things here. I don't. I don't even think people realize because I was stationed at Fort Story. And there were certain buildings that you learn that if you show up at that building, you might be greeted with a black rifle telling you you shouldn't be knocking on that door or walking around. Yeah, We have EOD. We have all of that. Um, were you actually equipped to cover this area? Because how many secrets are here? Equipped the best you can. We partnered with NCIS a lot down there. We partnered with uh, the military down there. We partnered with our NATO allies down there because NATO's headquartered down there. I mean, we did a lot of work jointly because when you work in this world and especially when you're in a country like the united states that operates under this thing called the constitution that very few other countries have and all the limitations we have and the financial limitations we have because people don't want to invest money in this part of our economy you really have to rely upon partners it's huge partnerships and that's why we partner with industry we partner with our clear defense contractors because there's hundreds of them that mm -hmm. that support this effort and so it's making friends and relationships and forging trust with everyone you possibly can and, and sensitizing them towards a threat so they'll bring it to you rather than you trying to hunt it down and so that's the greatest challenge we have is is having individuals that can create trust that's why trust is my thing because it's not just recruiting a spy. That is the height of it all. But there's all this other stuff we got to do in order to even come close to doing that. And that happens through partnerships with everyone and creating great, healthy relationships where we can protect people and their way of life. That's really everything comes down to how do you keep people safe? And just so, to add to that, sorry, really quickly, there are masses and masses of private intelligence companies and there's so many contractors now, more contractors than what there are actually government workers in uh, in the US when it comes to the intelligence industry. So uh, got a big old army. I, I have a question. Do you do you ever, uh, like in your experience, do you ever have a hard time or do you ever, have you ever found yourself yeah. having a hard time kind of like turning that part of your brain off? Which part? Uh, my brain's mostly off. <laughs> I mean, just the just detection uh, the, manipulation. The, yeah, yeah. I don't I, manipulate. Right. I mean, just okay, fair. I, 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 that's that. That's an inaccurate statement. Every single <laughs> human manipulates. Every Someone, single human manipulates. So I do. Okay, so I'll, I'll say I'll say it like this. Then I will never argue context. Uh, I do all I can to be as transparent as humanly possible with everything I can because I don't want anyone to ever feel unsafe around me. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And uh, I'm guessing, Robin, wh where you're going with this is you're building relationships. So you're always trying to build relationships no matter what. Yes. So you never okay. turn it off. You don't have to turn it off. 
It's who I am. Because it, it, if you're going to the store and talking to the cashier, you're trying to build a relationship Fair. for the yeah, transaction, exactly. which is just a lower level, but not necessarily that different than talking to somebody in the field. I have found in my life and I've, I've been down the journey of eliciting information and getting pin numbers. And I've realized why that worked. And I, 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 and I am a hard charging type a look at that background I have. And all I've ever realized through everything I've ever done was that when you're of service to others and you make them feel safe and you, and you're organic and congruent with your behaviors and your actions and your personal brand, that's when it all falls into place. And so don't be anything other than you actually are. And and everyone that sees me here, if you see me on with Gavin and, and Lena, or if you see me on my own podcast and you see me like in my house, I am exactly the same person. Everyone, I preach the same things everywhere because that kind of congruency is my brand. It's my mm -hmm. lighthouse of, hey, if you want to have a relationship with me and if you have a pain point you think I can solve, come here. I'll, I'll be that person for you. All right. I got to <laughs> thank you, uh, Jennifer Sprague. I think it's been super okay. interesting too. And okay. folks, if you like this, Gavin has a YouTube channel. They are going to be continuing with the conversation with another guest that I've had on many times before, Lena Cisco, who's an amazing um, body language expert like Gavin, a statement analyst, et cetera. And thank you, Lindsay Metcalf. So, as I close here, don't worry. You're going to be moved right over to check out their show, which they do generally after mine on Thursdays. So Robin, Gavin, Rob, Alita, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. Great meeting you all, too. Yeah, yeah likewise. Thank you. Okay.